Joining us today is Robert Shibley. He's the Executive Director of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. He's here today to talk to us about a recent op-ed he wrote in the Wall Street Journal, highlighting the important changes brought about the Trump administration's uh, Title IX, new Title IX regulations. So Mr. Shibley, thank you for joining us. Uh, I guess I wanna start out for the viewer. This is a bit complex, but for those of us who've been following it since I guess uh, Education Secretary DeVos first announced she was gonna make changes, what are the most significant changes uh, that are going to be implemented now that make the new Title IX regulations different than they were before under the Obama administration? Well, uh, there. Are, thanks for having me. There are a few really important changes. Um, uh, first, uh, just from a procedural uh, thing, which as a lawyer is, is important, and actually it's important for all of us, um, the new regulations actually went through the proper uh, procedure in order to have regulations. The Obama administration, um, instead of issuing actual regulations, which means that you have to uh, give everybody notice of what's going to be in them, um, and then let people comment on it, and then the government has to respond to the comments and then release the regulations. Instead of doing that, the previous administration, uh, back on April 4th, 2011, sent out this Dear Colleague letter. It's called that because it starts Dear Colleague and effectively engaged in regulating without actually going through any of the niceties. This thing just uh, popped out um, and then uh, was uh, considered to be a mandate even though they don't technically have, a force, uh, have the force of law. These regulations went through the right process and that's important because it's part of what makes government accountable um, to us. Uh, as for the substantive parts of the regulations, um, they actually guarantee a lot of things that aren't gonna surprise anybody listening to this. In fact, it'll probably surprise you to know that uh, if you were uh, being tried for sexual misconduct on campus on, um, you know, previous to these regulations uh, being put in place, uh, you lack a lot of protections that are now gonna be in there. For one thing, the explicit presumption of innocence. Uh, we had found uh, that a huge number of uh, campuses, uh, 70, 72% uh, of the top 53 in US News and World Report didn't even have the presumption of innocence for students. Um, you have proper notice. Uh, you, they actually have to let you know exactly what you're being charged with and when you were supposed to have done it. Uh, you'll be able to see uh, the evidence both against you and for you. We'd actually uh, seen before in, in several cases, universities uh, had evidence that would have been exculpatory. Um, it would have helped to prove the innocence of people, but they didn't turn it over uh, to the students to review. Um, people will have the right to have an advisor, including an attorney, if they want one, uh, and that applies to both sides. They'll have the right to cross-examine uh, witnesses against them, um, including their accusers, um, and they'll actually have the right to um, uh, appeal, which not everyone, uh, not every place, uh, you know, currently gives, although most places do. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, regulations, but none of those are going to be odd or strange uh, to anybody who isn't currently on campus. Um, you, know, you would have these in any civil trial, um, certainly in any criminal trial. Um, you know, we were finding people uh, responsible for rape and sexual assault without the kind of procedure uh, you would get uh, for a parking ticket. And that's just not okay. And that's something these regulations uh, will uh, help to remedy. The other thing is um, a much better, the Supreme Court uh, definition of sexual harassment uh, when it's uh, student on student sexual harassment that actually requires that the expression, if they're gonna punish it, uh, reach the uh, level of being severe, pervasive, and objectively offensive and prevent somebody from getting an education, which is what the Supreme Court said back in 1999, uh, but which the uh, Department of Education uh, has sort of issued confusing things on in the last 20 years. Um, and uh, universities, of course, are able to, uh, when they have lower um, requirements for constitutional protections there, uh, they've used those sexual harassment codes uh, to censor huge amounts of speech ever since the entire time fire has been around and certainly my 16 and a half years there, uh, one of the most common ways to censor is to take advantage of uh, bad sexual harassment policies. How's it going? I'm Eduardo Norette with Campus Reform. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to subscribe to get our latest content, click right here. If you're interested in joining our team as a correspondent or an investigator, click there. And if you want to donate to make sure we can create more great content like this, click right here.